Welcome into the Hockey Show. That's a podcast because sometimes we want to go deeper than we can on the radio. And, well, that's a podcast. Our guest today is a journalist by trade, but so much more to the audience. He's been entertaining and informing and inspiring for over a decade. He's a wordsmith whose wit and humor mixes perfectly with an emotional intelligence and raw humanity that makes you not just listen, but to feel connected to his show. His empire has grown from the smash hit podcast Men in Blazers to an entire podcast network, not to mention the TV shows, a new book, a fresh byline in GQ, and a guest appearance on Jeopardy. And a brand new podcast <laughs> with my buddy Tommy Vitor exploring the World Cup, the corruption that landed it in Qatar, and how sports, even when they're bad, corruption bad, or Everton bad, can make us feel good. For Men in Blazers, World Corrupt, and co-author of the new book, Gods of Soccer, it's Roger Bennett. Oh, Craig, it is a joy to be with you and be with the, the listening audience in Washington, D.C., in which I lived for four incredibly happy years. Shout out to everyone in Adams Morgan. It's a delight to be back. It is so great to have you. Uh, that was my attempt at an homage to your introductions, which are always so fantastic on Men in Blazers when you have guests. When, why, and how did a perfectly elaborate introduction become part of your repertoire? That's a great question. I mean, number one, I can't stand being introduced anywhere. To, uh, I am American now. Uh, it's the greatest day <laughs> of my life becoming American. Um, but the tiny, tiny little bit of me that is still English is the part that can't stand any praise uh, or anything good said about me in front of my face because we're so filled with self-loathing. So I found that quite excruciating. But um, the introduction is really a technique that we develop. We do so many interviews and we've been so lucky to have so many individuals from the entertainment industry who want to talk about football and footballers from the biggest teams in the world who want to talk to America. And we kind of stand in the crossroads of those two audiences. And ultimately, you interview a lot of people, Craig, and you know, I interview a lot of people and the people who are being interviewed are interviewed a lot. And it's really repetitive often. You know, think about James Taylor singing Fire and Rain again for the 12,000th time and just being bored. Oh, God, can't play any of my new material that no one wants to hear. So playing the hits is quite boring. And I realized an introduction is a way of signaling right from the off that you have put in the time, you've put in the research, you've put in the thought and the care that you respect that your uh, guest has come on the show. Your life's too short. You want to make best use of everybody's time. Also, your listener's time. You want to signal to your listener that you're about to hear something that will add to your day, bring you joy or meaning or wonder or hopefully life lesson of some kind. And so no better way to do that right from the off than the introduction, even though yours was excruciating. I'm so sorry about that. I should have, I should have known better uh, to, to play to your self-loathing <laughs> British nature. Um, I, I'm, you know, I've been actually listening to men and blazers for, for a long time. Uh, I, I've, enjoyed uh, a lot of the stuff that you've produced over the years. Uh, but I'm curious, what did you actually do before Men in Blazers? Everywhere, if you do the research on you and, and the biography, it's just, he's a journalist. And then it's like, well, he started Men in Blazers here, and there's nothing before Men in Blazers. Yeah. So what did you do before ba Men in Blazers? Ba about when I had hair, you mean, and my own teeth <laughs> and all that crap. You know, I, I tell you, it's really a DC story. I was writing a lot uh, about a lot of things. I wrote books about bar mitzvah uh, culture of the 1980s. Uh, about summer camp, the cultural history of the 1980s. Um, I was, I've always been fascinated by America. I arrived here as soon as I could. I mean, I wrote a book about my love of America that I don't need to repeat now. Um, but I started to watch football when I lived in D.C. and it was broadcast on um, on, on a channel called Satanta, uh, which was hard to get and even more uh, for me to, to be able to pay for. And there was a bar um, called the Lucky Bar, uh, that recently shut down, but it was um, uh, just off DuPont Circle. And on a Saturday morning, they, they they had the rights. I think there were some Irish brothers who cobbled together a digital TV station. No one wanted Premier League rights. You could buy them for nothing. And so they broadcast it. They only got rights to the crappiest game of the weekend, always. <laughs> it was on at 7.30 a.m. It was always at Luton Town against Bradford. And it would attract, in those days, this is like the early 90s, it would attract a really macabre uh, group of expats. You know, I sat with these guys every Saturday morning for several years when I lived in D.C. I don't, none of them knew my name. I didn't know any of their names. We all knew each other really well. 
you know, there was the guy who'd like nibble his fingers when his team went 1 0 behind. <laughs> There's a guy that would just shout obscenities and his team went 1 0 ahead. And you know, one was like a line cook at the Mayflower Hotel, whatever. It was like, it didn't matter what happened in the real life. It was football at two hours. We'd have an English breakfast, watch it together. And there was never an American in there. In fact, why I said this a couple of times, one American came in once and said, "Hey, how are Fulham doing? A Fulham on the television?" <laughs> and and one of the Ameri- one of the English guys, a massive guy, uh, just a massive guy, got up and just slapped him on the face and goes, "Jog on, mate, jog on," which is the most menacing thing an English person can say to another person. And 2006, the USA were playing. I'm working on a podcast about the American World Cups 2006 was really a transitional one in terms of the audience in this nation. And I happened to be in DC um, that weekend with my wife, uh, the U S were playing Italy in a massive game. And uh, we went back to the lucky bar to watch the game. And to my shock, there was a line around the block um, that went as if the Beatles had reformed. I mean, it was chaos to try and get in. And I turned to my wife, I was like, Holy crap. That was the moment when I was like, something is happening in this nation in terms of gone from a self-loathing um, uh, uh, nation in terms of its uh, approach to men's football, at least. Um, mm. And I said to myself, I have to start doing football. This, this is this, this, this. If you project this forward, it's going to be amazing. And it's taken a little longer and there's been many, many mountains, many peaks climbed, seeing much bigger peaks ahead. But with the World Cup coming back here in 2026 to be in the United States, Mexico and Canada also, um, we are living in just remarkable golden times. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned there your, your love of the 1980s and how much you studied it and your love of America. Now, part of that, uh, from listening to you and, and knowing some of your work over the years and, and uh hearing you talk about your book and all of that is your love of the Chicago bears. And of course we are spending most of our show today talking about tomorrow night's commanders bears game. Raj, the bears fan. How are you feeling about this Thursday night uh, clash of not quite Titans? Look at that. I just got sent that, um, that it's kind of incredible to see that combination of Tracy Chapman and the Chicago bears helmet. (laughs) <laughs> by, by, by Primo Levy's collected writings, that's quite that's quite a combination. The, the, um, your background is just perfectly. It's it's a a lot of things that equal Raj. It's, uh, it's well done. It's I often ask myself if the Chicago Bears played Everton Football Club. Um, like, would that just be the the bowl of sadness? Would, would Tracy Chapman play that game at halftime? It's a, it's been a theoretical um, notion that I've always engaged with. Could anybody win that game? Um, and the reality is tomorrow, you know, this game is not, um, theoretical, but it's about as close to the Chicago Bears playing Everton <laughs> Football Club, uh, as could be. I mean, Ouch. it's just, it's just, I, I, I always have Tracy Chapman's debut album behind me as a reminder. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, the great Liverpool manager, always says um, soccer is the world's most important, least important thing. You know, you, you, you feel an agony um, in the second of defeat, um, but you realise um, ultimately, you know, you still have as many limbs as you did before the game kicked off. Life really has not been altered for you much more than the, the team you love has just lost. And I do. I always play Tracy Chapman uh, after an Everton loss, which is often just to remind me that however bad I feel, the, the, the human experiences Tracy's singing about were much, much worse. However, tomorrow night's game is probably the game that belies that truth. And uh, God, there, there can only be losers tomorrow night, Craig, really, can't there? There'll be no winners. No, there will be. Because no matter if the other, whichever team wins, it's like, oh, cool. Good job beating beating those guys. How does it get there? I, I've got to say, when I started watching oh, the NFL, Rod, which is not where you want my to days. Like, My God, I, I watched that Redskins team who smited my dynastic Chicago Bears. We were meant to win it all forever. And then, holy crap, you destroyed us. But the early teams I watched, the Theismann Riggins team, just the delirium in that city. When I moved to DC, game day for the Redskins. My God, you could. I mean, I, you, I'm going to take a deep breath because you talk about this all the time. It's not why you brought me on that show. <laughs> but that, I, other than that, what the Glazers have done to Manchester United, I have never seen an owner take something so jubilant, so joyous, so self confident, so assertive as an identity marker of an entire city and take a huge dump on it. It's really, it's really almost a remarkable feat in a surreal way. 
So this actually is what I want to talk about. That thing that you just mentioned. Roger Bennett is our guest, Men in Blazers. Uh, the new podcast he has with our friend Tommy Vitor is called World Corrupt. And it explores the corruption around the World Cup and FIFA and how we as fans and media interact with that tournament and that organization knowing about the corruption and the bad things, the awful things, the, the deadly things. 6,500 migrant workers died in building the stadiums uh, over in Qatar in preparing for this World Cup. And you guys close episode one of World Corrupt, which is available now uh, in the Men in Blazers feed and in Tommy's uh, podcast feed with Pod Save the World. Uh, you guys did close episode one describing the conundrum that so many of us face watching sports and especially here in D.C. Uh, because Dan Snyder is a horrendous owner, not just what he's put on the field, but what he's done off of it. He's a crappy so how, human being. He's a crappy, yeah, human, a crappy human being first, a terrible owner second. So how do you, and obviously this is what you ultimately build to in the podcast, but how do you square your love of sport and with the awful things and the awful people that sports can empower? God, this is a terrible week to ask me this in which the Yates report came out yes. in women's football, women's yes. football on the verge of becoming the sport that everybody's always dreamt it could be of just fat, delirious fan bases, 90,000 fans at Wembley, the quickest selling out game at Wembley history for the US women against England, uh, England women. Women. And of course, it, that game kicked off a couple of days after the Yates report revealed that at every single level in the United States, there was abuse uh, of every kind from the youth level to the club level at US soccer and was actually enabled and empowered by the individuals who are in power. And so you have the best of times, the worst of times. It's almost a Dickensian experience watching football um, at the moment. And I feel that very much as we approach Qatar when the US men finally, for the first time in my lifetime, this land I love, the nation I love, falling in love with the sport I love. Um, it's remarkable, this wave of young talents flourishing uh, in the elite leagues of Europe. It's incredible uh, to witness. And at the same time, they're headed off to a World Cup uh, 2022, which is going to be in Qatar, a nation which is uh, smaller than Con Connecticut um, and who won the World Cup uh, brazenly through corruption on our podcast. We interviewed a Department of Justice spokesperson from the time who went over there with Eric Holder uh, the, when the bid was announced. And he called it in our show. Episode two comes out on Saturday. He calls it the most corrupt thing he'd ever witnessed. And he cut his teeth, as he admitted, in New Jersey politics. I mean, wow. Tony Soprano would be rolling in his grave <laughs> to hear that. But that's the, the reality is that football, right. this sport that gives us, when we watch Lionel Messi just buzz through, uh, that gentleman with the supercut haircut, the unassuming superhero, just destroy um, the, the, the back line after back line. When we see, you know, Alex Morgan slay the uh, English defence and drink a cup of tea and say, sod it, Piers Morgan. You know, our hearts soar. Our, we feel transcendence. We feel a deep connection to everybody else in the world. That's what the World Cup is. The greatest instigator of collective instantaneous memory known to humankind. And at the same time, the people who run the bloody game the people who are charged with the self-keeping of the game, not to dislike your commander's debacle, are rotten to the core. In this case, it's FIFA who, you know, should we do the right thing or should we accept the uh, the bank of bank trucks, which are backing up to FIFA headquarters, uh, unloading gold bars? They always pick the latter. And it's impossible to square the two things away, Craig, which is why, I mean, it's also... For Qatar, it's geopolitical. So it's more than that. Right. that essentially, it's sports washing. Yeah, you have a Gulf nation that's in a very bad neighborhood that um, for geopolitical security reasons needs to have its name known around the world. And then it's got a problem. What do we want to be known for? Human rights abuses, L LGBTQ abuses, the fact that six and a half thousand human beings gave their lives to get the state ready for its fire festival of a World Cup, which is about to hold. Or do we want people, because the second football kicks off, we know, we know sports is dark, a rock that we lift up and it's full of repulsive. Uh, it's really a mirror to humanity, ultimately, and it's the dark side of humanity as well as the good. But it's the geopolitics that make this so bloody difficult. So I did team up with your friend and my mate, Tommy Vitor, um, who this is sports, but it's also geopolitics. So to unravel, right. to answer your question, Craig, we do have to unravel both sides. And so we ask these basic two questions, which are 
why would FIFA give their crown jewel of a tournament, which happens every four years, to a go- th- this place, which even their own uh, analyst said was ill-fit, completely ill-fit, felt every test, including can it be held in the summer? No, it's 120 degrees. <laughs> felt every single test that their own uh, analyst said it needed to be passed. Why would they give it to Qatar? And then also, why would Qatar want it, really want it, in terms of sports washing, in terms of, you know, what would, how do they want to be known around the world? They want to be known about Lionel Messi scored this goal here, that um, Kylian Mbappe, you know, bent the ball from fourth. That's how they want that the psychological, emotional, mental thrill. And the real third question is, what should we as fans, what can the players do when they arrive? Because these guys have dreamt of playing in the World Cup. They didn't dream of this geopolitical hot mess that FIFA have dropped them into. What should they do? And what can we as fans do to make sure it never happens again? And, uh, you know, on our side of it, media, uh, if we put ourselves in that bucket, take our fans hat, fan hats off for a second. I often ask myself if if I what didn't have that hat, if I was just a fan, like, what would I do? Would I watch the NFL? Would I consume the commanders uh, or whatever team I might root for if I didn't get paid to talk about the commanders all the time? Uh, if we didn't do this, the talking, the writing... Do you, do you almost feel like we get a pass sometimes or we give ourselves a pass because we're like, oh, we, we have to do it because that's our job. We have to give this thing attention because that's what the fans want instead of perhaps shaping the conversations around these. Or is that is that what well, you're trying uh, to do uh, with this podcast? It is, it is, it is. Like I wanted to know retrospectively after this World Cup of horror has taken place that I didn't just normalize it and just pretend that it wasn't happening. It's complicated. It's hard bloody work to think yeah. through. This podcast has been one of the hardest things I've ever worked on. Um, and I'm grateful for my partnership with Tommy to be able to hope, uh, you know, we're not, we hope to stick the landing like Kerry Strew, but um, we'll see what our, and it, the, the response has been very validating. But I think I went to the, the last World Cup was in Russia. And I went there um, and reported back you know, how great Moscow looked, St. Petersburg. And like hundreds of journalists I've spoken to, we now realize we did Vladimir Putin's bidding for soft power. Uh, we were doing exactly what he wanted. Um, and I don't want to do that again. So I can only say what I'm doing, which is to not go to Qatar. I don't even really mention the word, to be honest. I, in the run-up, I, we talk about World Cup 2022. We don't, right. uh, t- I don't want to give them anything. Um, but at the same time, World Cups are spines of joy in our lives. They're the backbone of wonder. Um, and it is hard to square that. So if I want to watch the football and revel in it, even as I point to the darkness that FIFA have created and never let it happen again. So what we're doing, we've decided to, uh, Men in Blazers, we're going to tour the nation. We're going to tour America. We want to make sure that America feels like it's won the World Cup, whatever happens on the field. Um, we're doing a tour. We're going from sea to shining sea, where every night we'll be in a different city, bringing together an audience, wear your polyester jerseys, bring your banners, raise your TFOs, come and have a drink with us. Um, and there's few cities I love being in from a footballing culture more than uh, DC. And we'll be there November the 26th at the Capital Turnaround. Um, early round games will be breaking down. And I think there's a way to savor. Uh, the moments together, make collective memories together, even while we create a critical distance to to the crap that FIFA have forced us to grapple with. That's the worst. This is a self-inflicted wound. It really didn't have to be this way. Yeah, uh, that's that's so well put. And uh, hopefully I see you on November 26th. Though. That's good to know. We will uh, we'll see if we can we can get together um now someone who i'd imagine you'll probably have there is our other mutual friend the queen of soccer in dc the great andy sullivan uh what is your go-to andy sullivan story because i know raj as someone who used to work for the washington spirit doing media i know how much andy sullivan hates doing media yet she is a frequent guest with you for some reason you are the exception so what what is your favorite or go-to uh sunshine andy sullivan story kind of I, I you know i really I did not know that, that she does not do media because she's so bloody good at it and she's a real she leader is. and she's so emotionally intelligent. She also brings out, we have a podcast called The Women's Game, which is a weekly podcast with a rotating 
Uh, I, mean, I will say the, the rise of the women's game in the United States, but also in England, where I grew up to be a women's football player. We were a terrific, misogynistic, macho society. And to be a football player when I grew up and to be a woman was to be just flung to the periphery, to be mocked and derided. We didn't have Title Nine. We didn't think about girl, girls playing sport. That's a man's game. <laughs> I mean, it was horrible, horrible, horrible to yeah. see the nation England now have this team, the Lionesses, who are one of the best in the world. They just won the Euros. The whole nation adores them, rises to what witness their glory. It's the joy of my lifetime, and it will be the story of the next decade in world football is the rise of the women's game in a delirious fashion. Um, and Andy is part of this new wave of young U.S. players. There's a, there's a changing of the guard within the great U.S. women's national team at a time when um, the rest of the world is getting bloody good at they, uh, football. They didn't have Title IX to propel uh, a rich squad en masse, uh, but they did have you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid, the tactical know-how in Spain. Um, in England, the Premier League teams have started to invest belatedly in women's clubs. and The coaching, the tactical knowledge has given these a very different style of football. And so Andy's coming through at a time when US hegemony is essentially being shattered. US are still great um, but there's other great teams, truly great teams to battle uh, against uh, with them. And watching Andy try and think her way through this new reality, it's been a privilege with all the women um, on the Women's Game podcast. And I, there's few more um, intellectually curious and emotionally intelligent footballers uh, that I've had on my show more than Andy. And Godspeed, I cannot wait to be in D.C., and please, God, fingers crossed, you will be joining us live on stage. So come and be with us. Tickets available at theblazers.com. There you go. Uh, and I know also with the episode that I have in queue right now is with Trinity Rodman of the Washington Spirit as well. So Amazing. Uh, I'm excited to listen to that uh, as soon as I get the chance. Um, Raj, unfortunately, we are very short on time, but I do want to ask you quickly about the book. I always ask, This is my number one question when someone writes a book. Why'd you want to write a book? So you only got like, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but why'd you want to write the book? Uh, to destroy the book industry once and for all, <laughs> to just finish Excellent. it off. Great it's, barely, it's barely hanging on. We tried with our first <laughs> book um, and now we've come back with Gods of Soccer, which is, uh, there's a book called um, Good Night. Uh, oh, you beautiful human being. Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. That I've loved uh, reading with all of my kids. It's just beautiful heroic stories of endurance, loyalty, pathfinding, social change. And really, we just wanted to write a book. Football, to me, is about holding up a mirror to humankind. And I want to write a book filled with 100 great, incredible Maradona, Pele, Mia Hamm, Alex Morgan, and, and players you won't have heard of, but are so deeply um, inspiring. And, and the opportunity to do that and make it the perfect complement for families ahead of this World Cup, um, it's really been a joy to put together. The book, Gods of Soccer, is available now wherever you get your books, meninblazers.com. Make sure you check out the podcast as well, World Corrupt, in the Men in Blazers feed or in Tommy's Pod Save the World feed. Raj, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Craig, Godspeed. I hope we both make it through Thursday night intact. Come on, <laughs> the best. <best. laughs>